Hey, this is Vivian Jones. This your child and crosses. Child and crosses. Oh, you see the child and crosses. Child and crosses. Jones. If you want someone to mind you, you better go on and let me. Let me. Yeah, some of the parents for know why you never go on with you know. Don't allow you youth to roam the street. Take responsibility for the youth. You know what I'm here tonight? You know what I'm going tonight? Good evening, guys and gals. How are we doing? How are we doing? The snow, believe it or not, the snow has been playing havoc with uh, my technical... I have technical issues every week, don't I? Have you noticed that? I have technical issues every week. I don't know what it is. I'm going to blame the snow. I'm going to blame the snow. Who run out there in the snow? That's what me want to know. Who run out there in the snow get chill blades? Eh? I want to show you something cute, yeah, before I get before I even get going. I want to show you something cute. Yeah. This right is my um this is my granddaughter in the snow, right? For the very, very first time. She ain't seen snow before in her life, right? And um this was how she she responded it. Oh, she, she ain't she ain't trusting that snow, boy. She ain't trusting that snow. She ain't trusting that snow. But I thought that was cute. I just thought that what I would do was um, just show you my granddaughter in the snow for the first time. Yeah. <laughs> but how are we doing, people? How are we doing? I'm feeling good. I'm feeling healthy. Hello, Alfia. Good evening, darling. She's got the longest hair, I'm telling you. Trevor, how are you doing? Aston. Ast yeah, Aston was running in the bloody snow. I don't know what big man like Aston in the snow, you know. The snow catch him out. The snow actually caught him out. Claire, how you doing? Good to have you, Verona Jolie. Thank you very much, darling. She was cute, wasn't she? She was cute. She was cute. She was cute. She was out there playing, playing in the snow for the first time in her life, I tell you. She ain't seen it, man. Rudy, you'll never shut up, shut up. Don't even go there. Don't even go there. All right, all right. You're through to the fifth round. So bloody what? So what? At least, at least I put my hand up before you come and start mess up my page with some of your images and some of your madness. So Denise, you didn't get out in the snow. Denise did not get out in the snow. Denise was just there going, no, no, no snow for me. No, 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 no. No snow for me. Thank you, Verona. Much appreciated. 
So the room is definitely warming up. The room is definitely warming up. I can feel the spirit. I can feel the energy. All those who have never been here before, thank you for joining me. Uh, my name is Rudy Liquid. I'm the host of um, Keeping It Real. Getting behind the backstories of, um, I would say, superheroes in our community who never get a look in. I am like the black Des O'Connor, in truth. Yeah, because Des, Des O'Connor never sat down with Peter Huntingale. Do you know what I mean? I, the only person he'd most probably sit down with is Idris, because Idris big, no. But if Idris weren't big, he would never sit down with him. You know what I mean? So I like to go out and get our, our, our superheroes, our role models who do stuff behind the scene um, and bring, bring them to the forefront. Empress Remy Emmanuel, blessings, 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 blessings. Thank you for joining me. Make sure that um, if you do come into the room, yeah, and you've, you've, you're, you're, here, you're here for the first time, that you share it. Because my name is not Eddie Nesta. I mean, I'm not big numbers like that. I need big numbers like that, right? I need people to share it, especially if I don't think anyone's popped into the, um, onto the YouTube. But if you are going to be on YouTube, make sure you subscribe. Important, man. Important. Remember, um, nobody's funding me, right? So um, may I do this all on my own back and may I do it from furlough? May I do it from furlough? Yup, yup, yup. Hiya, peeps. Got a dinner pan with fire in between Una and the chicken. Shut up. You just cracked chicken bone. We know about you. <laughs> whatever you do, whatever you do, yeah. When you go, if you go to Kentucky and you go with Leary, don't make him don't make him stare at your chicken bone. You don't want that. You don't want that. Good man, gone. Don't tell me you were in and out. I can't angle that. If Carl could come in all the way from Wales, Aston Metaphor Jones, yeah. And Carl got sciatica. He might have a bad nerve. He might have a bad nerve. Yes? But he's here. Greetings, 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 greetings. Empress said, with the pan 100, with the pan fire. All right. Well, let, let's... Oh, Natural Mystic. You're in the... You're in, Okay. Natural Mystic is in um, on YouTube. I hope you're not lonely, by the way. I hope people will go... There'll be more people coming on later on and joining you. Um, all Leary talk about is food. He cravens, craven as ras. Okay, let's move the show on. Let's get to where we went to, where we're meant to get to. Ladies and gentlemen, I have an author for you. Um, this is my first author on my show, I'm proud to say. Um, hails all the way from the Midlands. The brother is from the Midlands. Yeah, check him out. He's got some wicked pictures. Wicked. Wicked pictures. Me I like proper, proper old school. Proper old school. Nah, man. Well, go on. Hey, everything is great, man. Everything is nice. Everything is nice. How are you, bruv? I'm good, man. I'm good. How are you? Well, I'm dealing with I'm dealing with the snow by not going in it. That's how I deal with it. I'm not going yeah, in it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not excited by it. I'm not. It, 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 as far as I'm concerned, snow should come Christmas Eve, yeah, That's and then right. leave That's on right. Boxing Day. Come Christmas I've Eve. I've always said this country, it always snows late. It, it, the snow always comes too late. It's, 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 it's the global warming, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. It's the global warming. So let's get behind definitely. you, Norman. Norman, um, yeah. sir. Um, you're an author. You're an author. I am. You're an author. Yeah. You're an author. And um, you, 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 um, hold on, hold on. I've got to do something here. Um, you reside in Birmingham? I do. Yeah. Born and, and raised. Uh, <laughs> born and raised. But the thing is, is what yeah. part of Birmingham? What, what actual part of Birmingham? At the moment, I'm uh, living in Neachels, but uh, I originally grew up in Small Heath in Birmingham. Okay. B10. 
So big up to the B10 pass you were listening. <laughs> is, that, is, is that what you call them? The B10 pussy? The B10 pussy, yeah. Okay. Um, I don't, I don't, I can't even recall if I've ever actually been there. Um, that part of Birmingham itself. Because um, mm. normally when I do come to Birmingham, it's mainly uh, city centre. Yeah, yeah. It's either the um, Alexandra Theatre for me. Yeah, I know the, yeah, I know the Alexandra Theatre. You've been to the Hippodrome? Yes, the, the, Hipp the yeah. Hippodrome, or I end up doing, um, I don't know if you've heard of uh, the Glee Club. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've never been there myself, but I've heard of it, yeah. It's a fantastic comedy club. How could you? So, 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 I mean, you, you, you don't frequent no, um, you don't, free, you don't frequent the comedy clubs, basically. Uh, I've been to a few when they used to hold them down at the uh, down at the drum. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, John Simit used to run yes. a few a few comedy shows. So yeah, he used to go to those. You know. Okay. But, uh, yeah. So um, I like your backstory. To be honest with you, your backstory is what I find extremely um, interesting in the sense mm -hmm. that. Um, your, your parents came over in what, the 50s, was it? Uh, 1950 was my dad and 1951 was my mum, yeah. Yeah, and, and um, what I like is that your, your, your mum never actually came over with the intention of being a nurse. That's right, yeah. Um, well, she was, uh, she was quite talented when she was uh, back in Jamaica. Um, she used to make a lot of dresses and suits for men. Mm. So when she came, when she came over in uh, 1951, um, she worked with a, a small Jewish clothing company as a seamstress, mm. you know, mm -hmm. so that's how she started out. And uh, while the, um, the, the, the West Indian community started to get married and whatnot, and they couldn't afford to go out and buy the wedding dresses, mom used to... Uh, make the clothes for them, make the, the suits and the, the wedding dresses and so forth, you know? So later on, she decided that she wanted to uh, join, marry the two, uh, being a hairdresser and a beautician, as well as, um, as, well as uh, making dresses and suits and whatnot. And uh, she went she about studying for it. Mm, she, 19... did a fantastic, she did a fantastic job with this woman's hair because God knows it must have been a rug when she first got hold of it. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, the old beehive there. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And then, and and there, and there, there's that's mum and dad with you, I believe. Is that right? Well, my dad's not in the picture. The mm. the guy standing, the guy, the two guys are standing there. Are my godfathers, uh, Uncle Basil and Uncle Wills. And Uncle Basil's wife, Aunt Olga. Yeah, and that's okay. me. That's me in my mom's arms right here. So that was okay. May 1959. Raw. Raw. Yeah. This is what I'm saying, ladies and gentlemen. This brother has got a, a, a proper backstory, um, which, which, which can only be appreciated in truth. Because when I see images like this, that's you and your brother? Hello? Has he frozen? Don't tell me you're frozen on me, bruv. I, I can see your chair moving. Um, can you hear me, Norman? Oh, my microphones, my earphones are not working that well. Hang on a second. Say that again, bro. Okay. Um, I was just saying that I can see, is this you and your brother on the doorstep? That's me and my brother at the uh, at the uh, the shop door of my mum's uh, hairdresser shop. Yeah, because was that I one of the I was first about three or four mm. years old? There, and that's one of the first hairdressing shops. Um, is that one of the first hairdressing shops in Birmingham at the time? Well, um, my mum was the the first black independent businesswoman uh, when she opened up her shop in 1962. So yeah, she was the uh, she was the first, and she didn't just do uh, black women's hair. She did she was universal. So 
or all, all, all uh, collars and creeds came into the shop and had their hair did. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Because here, here we could see you growing up. Um, alongside yeah, that's me and my. Uh, yeah, that's me and my foster foster brother's uh, suit. <laughs> <laughs> but they're great shots, man. I really, I really do like these shots. I remember. I mean, that's that thing, that little puffy that you're sitting on there. I remember we used to have one of those in um, in our front room um, back in the day. It was something yeah, that me that, and my brothers. Yeah, that was uh, uh, that photo there was uh, Christmas 1977 in Canada with my dad and uh, my second mum. I call her. Yeah, your second. That mom. was good times. Yeah. Mm. It looks like because you said it was actually quite a great time to grow up in. Um, Small Heath. Um, yeah. Yeah, because um, Small Heath was... Uh, well, everybody's heard about Hansworth. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's and... where all the villains come from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go that far, but... Um, well, I know you don't want the burger bar crew uh, after you. Uh, You're so easy, isn't it? Hansworth was more... Yeah, well, that's that's... That's more recent, but um, yeah, uh, they, they uh, when when the um, our parents first came over, most of the Jamaicans went to settle in Hansworth. Okay, and um, in S Small Heath was like the second biggest um, population of West Indian community, but it was different to Hansworth because they had um, all the islands in that area: Barbados, Trinidad, Saint Kitts and Nevis, Jamaica. Everybody was all mixed up in there, so. Um, but it was it was it was a good time living in Small Heath because everybody knew everybody, and you know it's one of those ones where if you walk down the street and you don't say hello to Miss Brown, you come home and get a get a little slap. <laughs> and it's, yeah, um, Alf, and it's Alfie a, was asking. Alfie was asking, is that Spring Hill, Birmingham? Spring Hill. Yeah, I think you'd better understand the question that she's asking than me. But is that was that Spring Hill, Birmingham? She says. Uh, no, Small Heath. Okay. I know okay. Spring Spring Hill is um, heading towards Smedic Way, I think. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 I'm with you, bruv. I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. I just love these black and white photos. I really do. Yeah, that's I really that's do. me. Uh, that's me in my mom's arms there. I think that's when we went to, uh, I don't remember it, but that's when we went to Scotland in 1962 on a holiday, something like that. Mm. That's my dad on the, uh, that's my dad with my brother holding the ball. Mm. Yeah. Mm. 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 So people used to, I believe that people used to come, you know, when family and that used to, to arrive in the UK, your, your dad used to put them up. He said uh, not your, my dad, oh. no. Um, uh, when when my dad came over, he uh, he lived in um, Aston for a little while, and then he moved to Mosley. Uh -huh. But um, there was there was a, a family that used to um, own a house, and they used to um, put people up, you know, rent them a room and whatnot mm -hmm. when they uh, when they came over. In fact, tell them what the prices of houses was back then. That would that people will blow people's minds. Well, um, my dad, I was having a, one of my many conversations with my dad, and uh, my mom and dad got married in 1954, uh, March 1954, and they bought their first house in uh, 1955, I believe, and my dad showed me the receipt, and it was one thousand. 680 pounds, uh, some shillings and pence. Rah. That's all it was. <laughs> Can yeah. you imagine if we could buy houses like that now for that kind of money? Everybody would have it three, five, sweet, wouldn't it? It would be sweet, man. Yeah, everybody would have <laughs> five ulcers right about now. You get what I'm saying? True, but then true, the, thing is, the thing is, is that you started growing. You started growing up and you started um, venturing out into the sound systems and what have you, if I'm correct, yeah? Yeah. And um, you developed a love for basketball and football. I did, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, I used to play football as well, but um, I got um, a high tackle and studied when I was 14, almost broke my leg. Mm. And I was off school for about two weeks and I, I retired from football at the age of 14 and decided to, to play basketball, which I was better at. I was quite right. good at football, but I was better at, better at basketball. And plus, it was inside. You didn't have to play out in the cool in the play, playing fields on a Saturday morning, you know? So Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm feeling that. You know, I'm feeling that. I'm feeling that. I'm yeah. feeling that. But then let's let's get into you. So where did the love of writing come from? Where did it actually stem from? The love of writing. Well, um it was three it was there's three things really that that sparked me off as to be a writer. But the first one was um when I was about 10. And I was in junior school. Um, we used to do the, the ordinary English lessons, you know, punctuations, paragraphs and all that kind of stuff. Um, but then we used to have our lessons three times a week. And on the third lesson of the week, um, our teacher, Miss Ward, used to write five essay titles on the board. And she said, write a story that uh, if choose a title and write something that inspires you from that title right. so I my imagination used to go run wild you know and uh, I never used to finish my work but um, during parents evening um, the be, the real bugbear with my English teacher and my mum towards me anyway was that uh, my English was good I always used to get an A in mm. English but I never used to finish my work so my mum used to say to me Try and finish your work, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but that's uh, that's how I started off writing, and then okay. um, and then uh, if you like, if you want me to carry on, I mean, fast no, forward. No, I do want you to carry on because if, if if we do fast forward and we start talking about how you started to get interest, what what was you writing about that caused an, an interest from the community in terms of what you was writing about? Because I think this is a fantastic story. Yeah, well, um, it, it, it happened when I was about um, 12, 13. Um, we was uh, a, a watch match the day on a Saturday, on a Saturday evening, as I usually do, and uh, came came to school. We used to go to an all all boys school when I um, went to secondary school, and um, we was uh, all all those kids was in the you know at the back of the class, and we was talking about. And I th I'm sure you remember the player, Clyde Best. Yeah, Trevor's going to um, love this story. Trevor's going to love this story. Go on, bro. Okay. So it was, uh, we, um, we was uh, all enthusing about uh, Clyde Best. And uh, we were saying, oh, you see, see the way Clyde Best played yesterday and da 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 da. And we said, yeah, 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 yeah. But um, there was this one white kid in the class who was a bit of a pain in the butt. Yeah. And he said, oh, black players can't play football. If there was, if black players could play football, how comes there ain't, you know, there's only one black player and he plays for West Ham and that's Clyde Best. You can't, you lot can't play football. So we had a big argument in the class. It spilled out into the corridor and then spilled out into the playground and almost broke out into a fight. And um, mm. our uh, football coach, at the time, Mr. Williams, so like intervened in the argument, and he said, um, he said to us, "What's going on?" So we, you know, we told him what was going on. So he said, "There's a simple solution to this." He says, "You guys choose your best black players, your best eleven black players, and you guys choose your best white players, eleven white players." And on Friday night, we'll go over to the Ritz, which was the playing fields across the road from the school, and uh, we'll, we'll play a game. And I'll referee the game, and I'll get some linesmen, and whoever wins, argument, argument is done. And we said, okay. So we chose our best uh, black players, and uh, we played this game on the Friday night after school, and obviously we won. <laughs> you wash them, Argument. man. You wash them wide, them. You clean them up. We wash them out, man. Yeah, yeah. We wash them out. So, argument done. So but that, that inspired that, me. 
Yes, this is what I want to get to. Go, 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 bro. Oh, you want me to go? Okay. Yeah. Um, that inspired me to um, start writing a book about a black football team called the Caribbean Stars. And it was uh, basically the story was about uh, a, a black football team that rose from non-football, non-league football, went through to the fourth, div- got into the fourth division. That that was the old fourth division as the uh, football association that it organized mm-hmm. then. The old third division, second division, and went up to the first division, which was the Premier League at that time. And um, and they went on to win the FA Cup, the League Cup, all the domestic cups, and the European Cup or the Champions League, as they call it now. And all the characters that were in this book, the players and everything, were the guys who took who took part in the game when we beat the guys in the in, in that football game. So I wrote Brilliant. twelve of those books. Yeah, I wrote twelve, 12 of those books. books. This is twelve exercise books, people that he took hold of. And each book was a chapter, is that right? Each book, each book was a volume. Each book a volume. was a volume, right. which, which right. represented a season. Yeah. Right. And what happened and, to those um, books? Sorry? What happened to those books once everyone knew that you started Well, I used, I used to, I used to, um, I used to lend them to uh, the guys them to read. And uh, they used to give me back and whatnot. But if, uh, when I had one of my first stories published, and I said to them, could I have the books back? Because I, ne- I just want to, you know, keep them as a, a, as a collection. And they said, no, nope, not giving you the books back. Because um, when you get famous as a writer, we'll have your handwritten stuff. And it's going to be worth a lot of money. So oh, okay. that was 50 odd years ago. <laughs> and I still haven't seen those books ever since then. Did you hear what and he it, just now said, ladies and gentlemen? He says, right, that we're at the at, at young tender age, right, he wrote a book about a black players and a real situation. And those people who were involved now are holding on to his handwritten scripts. Handwritten scripts. Yeah. And I think yeah. I think Norman deserves to get them back. Now, I don't know who's living in Birmingham right about now. Yeah. And if all these madam is 50 years old, then there's a chance that they are listening to him. I think it's about time you give them why back in books. <laughs> give them why back in books, man. Yeah? Because there's there's works that he can actually do with those books. And I think if if you lot don't give him back those books yet, yeah, I'm gonna start a campaign, right? So as that Norman can get those books back. Because those books can be turned into a play, they can be turned into a film, right? And it, it's, it's true, 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 true things that he's talking about. Because I believe you started to go to, you was going to the youth centre and what have you. And you had a, a, a teacher, an ex-teacher, um, who encouraged you to write more when you were 17, around the age of 17. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, wrote a, a, I wrote a short story for a, a, a local magazine called Small Eath Open Eye. And um, she said to me that, I was a, a, a very good writer and that um, she was encouraging me to write, to write more. Um, but if we go back just a little, say three years before, um, I, had, I had a dream when I was 14 that I was going to write a book. Um, the cover design was going to be drawn by me, all the illustrations inside and whatnot. And um, so... I woke up and I set about working and writing the, 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 what you call the utopia story that could be published. And um, it so happened that I wrote it when I was 17. Um, I bought six exercise books, the old exercise books, them as you mentioned earlier. And um, I decided that the book is going to last Gonna, gonna, I'm going to um, write the book in six months mm. and each exercise book represented a chapter mm. um, so I set about writing writing um, Bad Friday as it was then and, okay. uh, and, and, uh, and if I'm correct Bad, Bad Fridays went on to be shortlisted uh, for the Young Observers Fiction, Fiction Prize 
Yeah, he did in 1982. Yeah. 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 And um I remember going to the uh the actual um awards and at the, when we went in at the table there was all these books that were shortlisted and um if I show you the actual I don't know if you could see it. We can just about see it. Yep, 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 yeah. yep, yep. That's Without the original help. book. Yeah. Same, same, same. Um, that's the same illustration. Um, but that was in the in the mix, and it was the book wasn't my book wasn't all that glassy, but to, for my book to get into into a a competition like that, we where public, you know, big mainstream publisher that published these books. Um, it was uh, an amazing feat, but the fact well, of the matter is that mm. when the book was published in 1982, I became the first black British-born novelist to be published in the UK. The first black British novelist to be published in the UK. That is phenomenal. Yeah, that is that is that is um, phenomenal in itself because the thing is, is that when um, Penguin and all those guys came knocking, um, what happened? Well, um, at the at the awards, I was getting all these cards put into my hand, and um, there was a uh, the literature officer or the the literature officer at uh, Trinity Arts. He was with me. At the uh, at the awards, there was a group of us that went down, and he said to, he was quite good actually because he uh, he was looking after me in 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 respect of uh, not getting ripped off or, you know, so he said he said to me what what cards have you got? So I showed him all the cards and he says well, okay we'll have a look at these next week and and see what's what. So he chose Heinemann and Penguin for me to to ring and um so we rung them up and they they uh, wrote me a letter and said that I uh, they was interested in republishing Bad Friday and and developing it um which was the key word to develop because I wanted to improve it um so they said to me to send them the manuscript and uh, they'll have a look at it and have a read and see what they see what they can do so I did that sent it off to them and waited about three weeks. And uh, three weeks later, they wrote me back and said that um, my book was not marketable for, for them. So they refused to uh, republish it. So I thought, fine, you know, that was it. Yeah. But then on, on, on the second approach, it was a case of um, we'll work with it, providing you change the characters. Well, that was... Um, on that occasion, it was like because when the book was uh, was published, it was uh, it was quite popular in Small Eath, and it was the book was selling like hotcakes because we only did a thousand print run print, and um, so um, what, what I don't know how they heard, but um, within within the community, a lot of the a lot of the younger younger ones to me. Because I was like 23 when it was published, so these guys who approached me were about, you know, from 12 to about 16, 17, and they said they wanted me to write the book into a play, into a play, so that they right. could perform it. Right. And I didn't know, no, I didn't know head to tail of how to write a play at that time. So I says, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not thinking about writing plays. I just want to write books and even start working on some short stories. So, I, I, you know, so I thought, no, not, not going to happen. But, um, but there was three mainstream theatre companies that approached me in um, 1983. Um, and they said to me that um, they heard that I want, I'm going to write Bad Friday into a play. We'll be interested in commissioning you to write it for us, etc. So... They paid my train fare to go there and everything. They fed and watered me, gave me the all, all the pampering and everything. And um, eventually sat me down in the office with the, their artistic director. 
and they said to me, love, love the book, love um, for you to write it into a play, but this is what we want you to do. We want you to um, get rid of all the um, cameo characters that you have. Keep the two main characters, Delroy and Peter, but all the other characters should be white. And yeah. um, I was yeah. told that. I was told that three times on the three occasions when I went to these theater companies and I just went, well, that's not going to happen. Thank you for your hospitality. Goodbye. And so I went back to small Leith and I booked up with all the guys um, that were asking me to start run a, start a drama group and let's do a drama group. And I says, let's do this. You know, okay. so I just went back, went back home and, and did it that way. So, our drama group was started in 1983, Ebony Arts. And um, we had a load of members at the, at, at, at the start, but we knew eventually those who are really interested in acting on stage will stay and the rest will just peter away, which so happened. And um, I used to write plays for the drama group based on improvisations. I used to come in with my big ghetto ghetto blaster, put the uh -huh. tape in, and they would just um, do some acting. And I would just record all the scenes that they acted. And then I'll go home, listen to the tape, transcribe it onto, into writing, and then uh, produce a play that way. Um, you, actually did, you actually did produce the play, yeah? And yeah. um, I, what I like is the way you, the way in which you had to market it to the community in order for them to come and watch the play. That's because, right. Um, because when back we, in when, the day, yeah, yeah, back in the day, um, the ent for black people, entertainment was the dance hall. You know, if you're going out on the weekend, it was the dance, and we had we was. Um, sitting down as a, as a drama group thinking to ourselves, well, how are we going to get people to watch our plays? It's not a fact that the uh, black people were ignorant to theatre at the time. It was the fact that there was no um, plays that was representing them at the time. So it was a dance hall and, and nothing else. So to, for, to, to get them out of that and go watch a play was was a was a task so we decided rather than chase them and tell them to come and watch us we took the we took the play to the dance hall okay and what we okay. would do and what we would do was um the sound that was popular at the time like it could be love injection it could be up front it could be any quaker city, quaker would, city. i remember quaker man yeah you know, well not quaker city we got quaker city was a bit more you know uh -huh. Big man thing, you know what I mean? But we're yeah, talking well, we like I was, I was moving around with a big man them at the time, lad. I was moving around with a big man them at the time. <laughs> He's a Java man and a cool man. We was, we, was, we was fighting against your sound systems them time there because this is the same time when the, the Eddie Nesters and the um, Roger Griffiths and all of them lot was doing their thing in London. This is what was going on in Birmingham. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah because because. because um, our um, our ma our main uh, inspiration, right? From while we was living in Birmingham, was the Black Theatre Co-op okay. in in London. So and we're talking about Janet uh, Kay and all of them people he's talking about. You Janet know? Kay, yeah. Um, yeah. Victor Romero Evans, Romero Evans, all of them. Yeah. yeah, yeah, all of them. They were the duns of. They Black were. Theater. They were. Listen, man. They were on par with you, but London is at a dun. London is. <laughs> <laughs> Is that you did look funny, but you guys were on par because I mean, you took this and you traveled up and down. Come on, man, I'm bigging you up here. You traveled up and I know, down. I know, I know. I'm getting to, I'm, I was getting okay. to that. I was getting to okay, that, Rudy. Bro. I was getting to Sorry, that. Bro. But, Sorry, bro. Um, I'm excited because, um, people don't, this is this is foundation shit that we're talking about here, you know. Go, bro. Okay, um, so we used to, we used to, um, Travel all over the all over the country, um, performing our plays in Manchester, Stonebridge in London, um, Leicester, uh, Leeds, Sheffield, all over. 
um, Walsall, everywhere we went. And we took the play into the dance hall. And that's the, that's the way we brought the theatre to the people. And it turned out really good because they were, you know, black people are very, um, they're very participants in, in, in plays, you know. And you know it yourself when you're doing, doing your comedy. Uh -huh. That they take that they take part, they probably hackle you and all that kind of stuff. So calculate the words, um, man. Calculate the word, man. Sometimes I have to abuse them back. You know what I mean? I, the sort of language I have to come out with. I can't do it. Can't keep it real. I tell you the truth. The kind of heck for, <laughs> for, for real. Yeah. So for them, for them to be actually sitting down and watching plays that we were doing that reflected their lives and themselves, it was. Uh, Good times. It was good but times. But the thing is, is that throughout, throughout all of this that was going on, what was unbeknown to you was that um, the, the, the community was galvanizing behind you and encouraging you to write. This is why I'm saying, give the boy back his books, yeah? Give the boy back his books. You understand? All them people, them, all them big 50, 50 had 60 year old man, them holding on to this man's books, man. Give him back his books, yeah? Is that. Um, you were gradually turning into a role model without even knowing it. You were actually becoming a mentor because you're, you're a trailblazer within your own right, unbeknown to yourself. Yeah? yeah. That yeah. Um, this is all coming out of improvisation and this is all getting involved in the arts and, and everything and the arts councils. I mean, to the point where I know that you said you wanted to be, you moved on to be a tailor, right? But despite the fact that you were tailoring, you still continued to run the arts, the, 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 the drama group. You know, and... yeah. Well, the t the, t the tailoring was more back in the day when I was seventeen, and I, I worked there for six months. But by the time I was doing the ebony arts thing, I I was um, I was literally out of work. Right. I mean, during the eighties, I never I never had a nine to five job. Right. My thing was my thing was working with the drama group, and now and again doing basketball coaching. In, yeah, in, in the I, area, I so I, I couldn't help but notice that the uh, on one of the, the the fronts of the books, there it is. There's a there's a basketball there. Um, yeah, which is one of your favorite sports, no doubt. You know what I mean? No doubt. No doubt. No so, doubt. So so you're, you're you're continuing and you're you're going through the arts, which is um, great. It, it, it's it's because it's it's a, it's a lonely it's a lonely road, but it's a creative road, um, as I know. Yeah. Um, but then uh, it's like, where is it? Where is it? Can can because I mean, you you ended up you ended up. I want to talk a bit about your 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 family and you know how how they came into your life, how you started to grow, how you started to develop. You know, because you got married, I believe you married. Yeah, yeah, uh, and no. um, you're not married. No. <laughs> Okay, we won't go. We won't go too far. Oh, into those that, are my, those are my, those are my, those are my babies. <laughs> right. This is what I want to get into. I wanted to get to to your babies because the thing is, is that as they could see you moving and growing, you were you were Superman in their eyes. You know what I mean? You know. Yeah. But then the thing is, yeah. as children get older, um, I can I can talk about myself here. As children get older, I turn from Superman to dickhead, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I turn from the man who ain't allowing them to go out when they want to go out, coming when they want to come in. My little babies are no longer babies. Do you know That's what I right. mean? And they're not looking at yeah. me um, in the same way, sort of like thing. And it's, it's a big transformational change that can happen and also lead to depression, right? Um, yeah. Which um, I believe that you, which, you, you came across that. Yeah, I came across that in um, 2011. I think it was around about just after my birthday, September of 2011, I was really um, depressed for some reason. Uh, nobody knows how these dark clouds come over you, but I, I reckon it's um, a bit of overthinking. Mm. Um, uh, uh, it was around about the time the kids were sort of like grown up, shed the nest and yeah, because life having takes their it, fun. It shifts, it changes the balance and everything. It moves and... Um... I believe they they actually encouraged you to go back to to Jamaica. Well, it was it wasn't it wasn't Jamaica. Um, my brother 
who, who used to work for British Airways at the time when he when I was depressed, he said to me, "What what we need is a holiday." This is uh, mm. the summer of 2012, um, and we he planned to take just he, he paid for my fare and everything, and just mm. said, "You don't need to bring have no money. Just pack your bag. We're going to uh, visit Dad, you know, right. in um, Sacramento, California." So. During that time, I was saying, yeah, I'm going. No, I'm not going. Yeah, I'm going. No, I'm not going. And the kids came around and said, Dad, you need to just go because we don't like to see you this way. Um, so I packed my bags and I went. And I took um, all the short stories that I had worked on during the 90s and mm -hmm. um, whatnot. And I uh, sat in my dad's back garden and uh, wrote Britannia's Children. Okay. You know, in my dad's back garden. Yeah. Okay. And not so, only not only did you write those stories, but you also um self-published those stories, if I, I'm correct. Yeah, I did, yeah, yeah. Um I was uh that's Britannia's children there, yeah. Um I was researching for years how to um get my book self-published without actually spending too much money before the book actually gets published. And then I came across a website, feederead.com, which is um, run by the Arts Council. Uh, they give you freedom of reign to publish your book. You, if you have a manuscript, they just send you the, the templates and everything. It's all laid out for you and whatnot. And you could put your own publishing logo in there if you want to. They, you know, you got free reign to do what you want. And they publish a professional, professional book with the ISBN and everything, and it's all or and it's registered in the British Library and everything. So I thought I'd go that route instead of going going the route of um, sending my manuscripts to publishers and then get it rejected and whatnot. And I, I always kept on thinking about what my mum always used to say to me is that um, um, publishing, for you to be published, it's not a privilege, it's your right, you know, so that was always ringing in my head. I love I love your mum's spirit because your mum's spirit is running right through you, rude boy, because I mean, your, your mum came from a middle class black background um, where you yeah. where she had um, people work, servants actually, can I say that word? Is that the correct word to use? Well, they, they used to call them domestic help. Okay, so, so domestic back help. Back in Jamaica. <laughs> yeah, domestic help. Yeah, um, yeah. back in Jamaica. She was, she was, um, she was, um, actually my mum was born in um, Havana, Cuba. And how that, ha how that happened was it was that my grandfather was um, in, construc in construction work and he had a contract to do some work in Cuba for four, for four years. But he, he already had um, my aunt and my uncle, you know, little little toddlers. But uh, my grandmother was heavily pregnant with my mum, so um, he said to the he said to the uh, the people who were contracting him, "Can I can I bring my family over to Cuba with me?" Because he didn't want to leave them, and they said, "Yes." Yeah. So she was born in Cuba, um, okay. and she was there for four years, and then they came back to uh, Jamaica where they um, where they originated from was Flagstaff Maroon Town in mm. um, St. James, St. James, Jamaica. So okay. apparently they had, um, from what I've heard, they had, they used to have a, a big house and domestic help used to come around and do stuff. So um, that's, no, that's a good thing, bro. That's a good thing because that ethos has run right through you, and it's been it's been encouraging because you know even though you were going through the hard times, it was it was all it was always about self actualization when it when it comes yeah. to you to be able to go up and down the country doing your own thing. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm not trying to rely on the man and rely on the job, and I think that's so important. But I think the biggest thing that I hope people got actually picked up on was the fact that you said you can self produce, you can self publish. I mean, I've spent thousands of pounds um, working on, on my book, to be honest with you. And I regret not talking to you like maybe about two years ago. Um, yeah. 
you know, and it's it's it's. I always believe that it's the, the it's it's your background. It's your background that dictates, you know, your foreground to to to, to a certain extent. Well, yeah, um, I mean the thing the thing for me, um, back in the day, I mean, it was like I always had this thing about forget about funding and all that mm. kind of stuff. Mm. You know, if you if you, I, I mean, I've I've heard um, writers and um, poets say, oh, I've got this project that I want to do, but can't get the funding, can't get the funding. Mm -hmm. And I would say, well, just do it yourself. Just get, just, right. do, get, just get it done and worry about the funding later. Later, you know? yeah, yes. Just get it done because uh, um, my belief is that um, you, if you want to do something, might as well do it, get, get it done because when you get older, and you can't move that that well anymore. Mm -hmm. You're gonna live in these regrets to say that I should have done that and I could have done that or whatever. Get the thing done, you know. And, and that's what can, I love about then, you. I love about you is that you actually get the thing done, even through depression. You still took your stuff and you went over. You went over. You sat down with your dad. You sat down in the nice warm weather. Went hot, 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 hot. And you, hot. you, <laughs> you came up with the, uh, <laughs> you came up with the Britannia. Britannia, Britannia's, one, Britannia's yeah. Children. Yeah, yeah, Britannia's Children, Volumes 1 and Volumes 2. Um, yeah. People, if you really want to get hold of um, these books, are they still available? They definitely are, yes. Yes, definitely are. At um, okay. feederead.com. 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 Yeah. Now, when they, get, when they get to the website and feederead.com, all they have to do in the search in the search engine, just tap in Bad Friday, you know, my books, Bad Friday, Britannia's Children, and you know, they'll find the book there and they could they could uh, buy the books from there. So 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 make sure you do that, people. Make sure you do go out and buy the books. Um, Birmingham, I stress, I stress. If you know any other man them. Right, <laughs> any other man them who is all in on to Norman Samuda's books, yeah? Could you ask them to return them, or at least allow him to um, photocopy those books so that he can turn them into a script of some sort? We're coming in two minutes, Vivian. So that he can turn them into scripts. I think yeah. it's, it's imperative that we do that. And um, as I mean, I, I, I'll quickly allow you to not allow you. I, I would like you to quickly. Tell us the story about the um, the female netball team. Oh, the female netball team. Yeah, well, um, the, these were girls that went to school at Small Heath Community Centre, and they were pretty good at netball. But their teacher, um, their games teacher, Miss Cryer, um, she used to come and watch our basketball games when they used to play semi-professional for Small Heath Panthers. And um, she approached me and said to me, I've got a group of girls who are really interested in basketball. Will you coach them? Because right. I've got a tournament, tournament for them to play in six months' time, and I, I would like to enter them for it. But, they're, you know, um, they play netball. So I says, OK. So uh, I think it was a couple of nights a week after school. I would go to the sports hall, and they will all be there, you know, gathered around. And to coach them was pretty easy because um, because they were uh, had a netball culture, they were able to pass and move, pass and move. So that was that was already there. The only uh -huh. thing I had to teach them was how to bounce the ball, control it, and shoot the ball on the move. Mm -hmm. um, that was the difficult part, and the different techniques in basketball uh, uh, that is different from netball to basketball. Um, and they took to it pretty well. And um, when the tournament came around, we went mm -hmm. to the tournament, uh, got to the final and won it, you know? So, and, and they were the underdogs. And uh, I'm sure you know, one of your contributors to your show, Julie Juice, was one Julie of Julie Juice was one of them. <laughs> was, one of my, uh, was one of my best players. Her, Liz, and... Um, Sandra were my star players. 
So you hear that story. This is how he became a role model. This is how he became a mentor without even knowing it, without even knowing it. And that's just I didn't even know. Yeah, just encouraging those around him to utilize the um the skills and the talents that he had, that they had. Sorry, not that he had, that they had. Um, and for that, I, I believe that you should be held up in high self, in high high esteem, high esteem. Um, you know, without a, without without a shadow of a doubt. So, if there's a young budding writer out there, what would you what would you be saying to him? Well, the first thing I'd say to them is don't take yourself too seriously. Read everybody that writes better than you, and um, write from the heart. Always write from the heart, and always write what you know about. Okay. That's so that means that if I should write what I know about, I've got to write about tumbleweed. <laughs> <laughs> I've, got to, I've got to write about a vacuum in my head of full of nothing. That's what I ended up yeah. having to write about. Oh, my God. But Norman, it's yeah. been great talking to you. It really has been great talking to you. And um, Thanks. I appreciate Thank you, for you having me. coming on this platform. And once again, I'm going to say Birmingham! Give the boy them back got in Birmingham. books. Give the boy back in books. Do you know what I mean? The guy's got story today. Imagine that he wrote about a black football team, yeah, that went on and conquered the premiership. You understand? It, it's, 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 it's like documented history that's never been told. Yeah. Um, so um, I'll, I'll come back to you a bit later, maybe about uh, just under maybe 45 minutes or so. Um, I'd like to say thank you very much for joining me. Okay. Yeah. And, um, bruv. Stay cool for now. I'm going to take you off the platform. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, that was um, the man himself, Norman Samuda Smith. You know, he came, he, 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 humble beginnings. Yeah, but as we can see that his, his mum was not humble. Do you know what I mean? His dad was not humble, right? It's only when you come to England, they try and humble you. Yeah, but you can see that his mum was not going to allow that to happen. Do you know what I mean? There was no way she was going to allow that to happen. And I think that's brilliant. Um, what I'm going to do now is obviously um, I'm going to bring on my, uh, my, my, my main guest tonight. Um, Norman could have been a main guest all by himself, in truth. My main guest tonight. I'm just hoping that he's going to sit down in the chair so as that um, people can actually see him. Hold on. Let me, just, let me just do this. One second, people. Bakar. When you when you when you when you, when you when you talk to some of these British superstars, you know they they're very own way. They're very own way. So me have to just me have to just call him, find out where him there. But yeah, um, let's see. Now I saw lots of lots of um, stuff coming up in the um, big up now, man. Respect, 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 respect. Big up. DJ Fridge UK, how you doing, my friend? I hope you're subscribing. I hope you're subscribing to my channel and you're not just going to pop here and then not, not, not bad at, not bad hit the button, you know? Hit the button, man. Hit the button. Me, you just lick the button. Yeah, do that for me, yeah? That'd be much appreciated. Um, I'm actually calling the man now, you know, on his phone. Right, his, his, his um, camera and everything is set up. Right, I'm just hoping that he's gonna. Um... Hold on, let me try this again. All right, I was I was just now told that he's coming. I was just now told that he's coming. So, um, must be eating his food or something, sir. He must be eating his food. Yeah, but what were your thoughts on Norman? What were your thoughts on Norman? Um, me too, D. I still play. Oh, you still play? You still play the old basketball, do you? Well, not right now, but theoretically speaking, you're playing in your head, Natasha. That's what you're saying. You're playing in your head. Yeah. Um, Trevor says, "Big up." He's clapping him away. Norman, I salute you. Norman's in the green room. He can actually read that and see that now. I can see this. All I can see is his teeth. That's what I can see is his teeth. <laughs> Look at that. That's what I can see is his teeth. <laughs> oh, my God. He, he's there. Um, Sharon is saying, I was a goal shooter. 
Sharon, you're too short to be a goal shooter. I would have blocked you from time. There's no way. No way. All you got to do is stand over, Sha over, uh, over Spice, yeah? And that's it. Everything block off. She now get nowhere. Uh, thank you, ladies and gents. I got to dash. All right. No, lots of love, Natasha. Lots of love. Uh, too many dislocations on my knee. You had to stop. I think there was quite a lot of girls who were into sport, isn't it? There's quite a lot of girls who are into sport, one way or another. Strong love. Subscribed. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Subscribed. Vivian Jones. Vivian Jones. Where am there? Where am there? Manabal. Manabal. Where, 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 where am there? Some people are saying that, Norman, you're definitely a legend. You're definitely a legend. Um, you're definitely a legend. Um... What I'm going to do, ladies and gentlemen, is I'm going to introduce you to my next guest. All right. Um, he is a British reggae artist who um, carved out his own name in his own right. I think we all love him, and I'm sure that we all love his music. Um, so allow me to introduce you to him. Whoa, where I said that? Yeah, what happened? <laughs> Mr. Vivian Love Jones. Yeah, man, there, you know. How are you, bro? How I'm are good, you? I'm good. Yeah? So yeah. How, 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 how are you dealing with the um with the snow that recently come up? Yeah, well, any weather, you know, we it's all weather, you know, four by four. <laughs> so, okay. Um, I'm, 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 I'm asking myself, where should I actually start with you? Because I know that you were, um, you was born in Trelawney, isn't it? Yeah. Trelawney, Jamaica. Yeah, man, that beautiful, beautiful countryside, you know? Mm, mm, mm. And when did you, when did you arrive in the UK? I arrived when I was 10 years old, you know? 10 years old. Whoa. Yeah. Whoa. Whoa, well, whoa. you see the thing about it, right? Mm -hmm. I was I, I was very fortunate, see, because I should have been here from the time I was three years old. Mm -hmm. But you I have some wonderful grandparents, them decide say, well, boy, them now go leg them little grandson yet, you know. So them have to just hang on for them grandson. So when I reach 10, you know, certain things go on and them say, you know what, my time you left you now. Okay, so it was it was so so when you was a so that's you as a little baby, that's her, yeah? No, no, I don't mean that man. I'm a dad. You did that. ask you, me did ask you that, you know. Me did ask you and you say, yeah, you that, you know. No, I never tell you nothing like that, man. You know, I listen good. Okay, okay. My ears, my ears full of wax, my ears full of wax. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> so it was your it was your grandparents who actually raised you then, uh, as a child up to the age of ten. Yeah, man. Yeah, and then you um then you arrived in the UK. Mm. So where did you where did you arrive first? Was it was it London or up 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 north or in the Midlands? No man, London, not Western. Okay, okay. Because I've always I've always lived London, you know. I, mean, I live by um, Wolsey yeah. Sports Centre. Yeah, well, you know, it's not Western. Me, Milan, we like Wills then from Wills then, you know, mm -hmm. and after that we move on to. Alperton, and then we'll move on to Harrow, you know. Okay. So yeah. And so so where did the love of where did the love of music come from for you? What was the inspiration behind your love of music? Well, the love of music, you know, was always in my family, even though I never know that until a, a later age, you know. Mm -hmm. Because there's people in the family who, who, who turn out to be great artists and thing and even gospel and church and all them thing there so we have, we have family that sing and you know so are there any are there any members of the family that we might know of yeah you might know the great jimmy cliff you know 
Is Jimmy Cliff is Jimmy Cliff a relative? Yeah, man, my mother cousin that man. Raw. Okay. Mm. Mm. Okay. Okay. Because uh, because I know that you said you went to um to Alperton School. No, I never go to Alperton. I went to Copeland School. Copeland, Copeland. That's right, Copeland, Copeland. Because it was um. But was I lived in Alperton, you know. Uh -huh. Yeah, because mm -hmm. it was in, it was. It, I remember when I went to Copenhagen School. That's where I I used to play the tenor horn for the the Brent School Choir. I actually, I, that was that was for actual Brent, you know. Mm -hmm. So did you did you participate in any of the um, amateur dramatics when you was at school? No, mine was mostly sports. You know, what was um, your what? Was, hmm. I play. Uh, uh, um, I run for Middlesex. I was the Middlesex two hundred meter champion, mm -hmm. nineteen seventy six. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I played um, rugby. Rugby, See, rugby. Yeah, I play rugby because my school did play rugby. You know, so you know, uh -huh. they pick you. Then would pick you from your school. Middlesex would pick you from your school, and you know. Yeah, but that wasn't really one of my favorite, you know, because I was really a footballer, so you know, yeah. And 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 so what what happened? What happened with the football? Did that develop? Did that? Did you end up um, playing for Brent at all? Or no, I end up playing for a, a, a amateur professional team. Them time there, mm -hmm. um, a Southall Football Club. Okay, you know, and um. Yeah, we got we got to a good stage, you know that, you know, with, with the football, you know, because um, I play against Chelsea, you know, when Dave Sexton was their manager, yeah, you know, and the chairman for my club was um, Ron Knowles, who later on um, was the chairman for Crystal Palace. Alan Devonshire was in my squad the same time I was there, you know. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm mhm. Mm Cause them, them, them are some big names when you talk about Dave Sexton and all, all of them and them. Um, it's just that it's funny. I was just now talking to um, Norman, and he said that the only uh, black footballer that we used to see was Clyde Best. Do you remember him? Yeah, man, a West Ham um, Clyde Best player for man. He was one of the first superstar black man in the football. Mm. So then. When you was when you were growing up, then and um, you you're obviously you was in Alperton. That means that you most really went to uh, Alperton Youth Centre, if I'm correct, because that's yeah, where... man. That's one of the main places where the career start, you know, mm -hmm. music start because we had a youth band that rehearsed in um, the back room in Alperton Youth Centre. Okay, okay. Because I mean, I mean, I remember when um, a lot of the sound systems used to go and play down in Alperton Youth Centre. Yeah, um, to, um, I'm talking about Lord Coos, them, them man. Them yeah, man. because we used to have a Friday night dance, you know. Uh huh. And um, after we was rehearsing in the back room, um, there was a Friday night that that, that was one of my first concert. We played on the um. You know the main hall where the, the dancer the dance used to keep, you know. Mm -hmm. And um was my first experience of playing live. And you know, playing in front of your bridge in them and, and your system them are uh, one of the hardest things, you know, when you come because um anyhow you go up there, you know, go and go to the room. I tell you, say, yo, what kind of idiot thing that <laughs> and, yo, 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 nobody go back up there and <laughs> No, I could believe that because the thing is, is yeah. that um, it was it, people were more talking about more more toasting on the mic than um, yeah. singing. Yeah, but but even before I started singing, you know, I was a DJ upon the sound system. You know, I DJ upon a loud, cool sound system. Mm -hmm. Neville Enchanter sound system. Uh -huh. We used to play in a club named Railway. Yeah, I know Railway. Yeah, man, and and all them places there, you know, and. And, and many of the youth center, and certainly we, 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 we youth bridging them, did have for them little sound as well, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, when it come out, we have a house party, and we have party are going, man. Them say, oh, just come in, come hold the mic, come hold the mic, and, and things go on, you know. Okay. Okay. 
So, so, so the thing is, is that when you, when you were, when you were deciding to leave school now, um, yeah. what did, what did you break out into? Well, I still was playing football. I mean, I play football at a, a high standard, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, but the thing about it, me get a lot of injuries. So every time me get an injury, you know, man, my bridging them so say, we say, Jones, at least you can't go kick no ball, but you can come sing, you know. So just come sing, you know. So we just we just go in and we start rehearse with the band, you know, because them days they have enough little band are going, you know. Mm -hmm. And everyone band, the more for them band to be the toughest band in the area, you know. Mm -hmm. So them way there, you know. Every time I get injured, man, me have to just all my foot and go a rehearsal, you know. And the man they used to love when I get injured because, you know what I mean, them want me come sing. Okay, so it was more, more the music was pulling you to it rather than you pushing yourself towards the music then? Yeah, man, now the music draw me in really, you know, because let me show you something. Rudy, me never see myself as no singer or anything like that, you know. That never really crossed my mind growing up. See, mm. it was more just a so, boy. I love play football, and you know, I have my nine to five. I'm a good, mm -hmm. you know? but the singing thing now is I think we just happen naturally. And you know, people who hear me singing, or even the school playground and thing like that, you know, because sometimes the girls and would have come draw me one side and say, Yo, come sing this song for it, sing this song for it. And they might say, oh, Sing a Dennis Brown tone. Silhouette mm -hmm. or something like that, or Delroy Wilson, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm still waiting on them. So them because them know say so we know them children because them know that we always are gonna dance. Okay. So we are gonna dance and party and them thing that so them know say so we know the songs them, you know. So them always used to call me and ask me to come sing and I sing and them always, you know, they always encourage me and rate me still. Okay, okay. So it's 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 really that the market was um just gravitating towards you. So the nine till five, tell us about what your nine till five was because people like to know the backstory of Vivian Jones. We, we everyone is very aware of the music that you've got out there. Um, but what they're not aware of is 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 your journey. Mm. Yeah, well, when I leave school, you know, me get a job before me even leave school because my mother and father are very strict and and thing and them say, well, boy, you make sure so you, you you go for your, your interview and get your job before you leave school. Mm -hmm. So me get my first apprenticeship, you know, I work for an American Ford Motor Company mm -hmm. car in a UK. Mm -hmm. See? And um, I'm always the... the, the um, the store man, them okay. days that them call it store man, where you deal with all the parts. You know, you order the parts, them stock the parts, them know where the parts, them there and them thing, you know. Mm -hmm. So, more the parts man. Mm -hmm. And we do that for good years still, you know. But them days then, you know, I remember saying, you know, man, just uh, earn something like uh, 12 pounds a, a, a week, you know. Raw. Right. You know, them days they were at uh, about 70s, you know. Yeah. Yeah, man, 12 pounds a week, my first job, man. See? And as you go along, you know, it, it, it go up and it go up, you know? See? Okay. But my one intention, you know, for me start work, me, me really want to head back to Jamaica. I wanted to return to Jamaica. My mother and father wouldn't allow me to do that while when I got to school, you know? Okay. Because maybe them things that I mean, they'll come back, you know? I can understand, but but the thing is, is that in the seventies you were with the like of the Spartans. So you uh, can you hear the feedback? Can you a bit a bit a bit of feedback? Yeah, 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 I hear that. Right, I'm not sure what's causing that, but I was saying that in the seventies the bands that you were um, with was the Spartans, I believe, the Doctor yes. Birds, the First Mighty Pipes. Was that was that a band that you put together, or was that you, was you drawn into that? Well, that band was uh, some of my friends, my elder bridging them from school. See? Yeah, you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yes, yeah, some of my elder bridging them from school. And they had a band. So 
them know so well me used to DJ. I always go out and DJ upon sound system and thing like that, a party and club, you know? Uh-huh. So they decide say, well, them call me and say, well, yo, me here you are DJ upon sound, you know. I know DJ you for DJ, you know, I sing you for sing. You for just so we have a band and we did on an act and lane on an hours then. Yep. And and we are here Sunday and we want you come in, you know. Mm-hmm. So I went there on the Sunday and from I go there, you know, it's like um um them ask me them start play a Bob Marley tune and I start sing the tune and from I start sing the tune I'm say yeah man yeah man and we just continue from there keep rehearsing every week you know okay. and um we start get bookings you know we start people start asking for player places you know okay okay so then so, so what what did the mighty vibes follow that because, like you said, and and what sort of money was you earning around that time? Because if if you get like, well, okay. right, hold on, all right, all right. yeah, you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you. I can hear you. All right, nice, nice, cool, cool. See, um. You wanna say yeah after after um Spartans yes it was mighty vibes mm-hmm. cause Spartans were not going really good and I had some other bands going and other bands influence all some of full musicians to go join for them band so right. Spartans kind of get mash up a little way you know mm-hmm. and let me explain to you you see with the Spartans Spartans had a brother called Tony Henry, which is Zungi. Zungi is the bass player for Misty in Roots. Okay. And Sparta, that was one of the band, our, our, my band member. The mm-hmm. other one was Clifton Bigger Morrison. Right. Seeing um, Aswad, you name it. Um, Freddie McGregor, um, Gregory, you name it. Man, in play for all of them, man. See? See. And um, there was also, uh, and myself. So there's three of us out of that band that reach to a a, a, a a good status in the reggae industry. Right. See, right. so we was a good band. See, so after that, now we went to Mighty Vibes. Mm-hmm. Mighty Vibes, there was some more bridge in them we know, and um, one of them was um, a brother to Simrans, one of the Simrans. Yes. See? Yes. All right. So you know, say well, boy, in a good state again. So with, 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 with um, Mighty Vibes now, it was a different st- vibe of music because members said the, the man them from Spartans was a bit older than me. Uh-huh. And whether a year or a couple of years, see? Uh-huh. Now, when it went to Mighty Vibes now, the older we depend on the same age group. Uh-huh. See? And um, we started rehearsing and, and the feel that we got from... Mighty Vibes was different from Spartans mm-hmm. because Spartan was a more um, popular Club. kind of song uh-huh. because we, we used to rehearse a lot of a, a lot of songs, the hit songs them, you know? Mm. So mm. We're, uh, we, we get to Mighty Vibes now. Mighty Vibes was more a deeper roots and culture thing like Lee Perry or original, okay. original Wheelers kind of style, you know? Uh-huh. See, and, that suit me good anyway, you know. So but it's funny. It's funny that you should say that because when you broke out into the eighties, you more went towards the lovers' rock side of thing. You more, if I'm correct. Well, I think I would. I would say that it's uh, because of the the songs them like um, um sugar love and them yeah. songs. You know, it was you know sugar love never make us a lovers' rock tune. You know, it just make us a tune. Okay. It, so okay. it's, the people, it's the people on the market who mm. take it and say, boy, I love us rock. Well, you know? if you got girls in the playground telling you, then why are you sing, then why are you sing? No, no, no that way, they're going to look upon you. And the girl, they're going to look upon you that way. Yeah? <laughs> I'm going to bring Norman in just to, um, to, to be a part of this, um, this <laughs> conversation now. But it's all about you, um, Vivian. Because in the 80s, if, 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 if I'm correct, yeah, um, yeah. you, you broke out as a solo artist. Uh, 
with that with that big hit. Good morning. Yeah, seventy nine. Mm. Mm. Seventy nine. Mm. So what would my kind of step away from the band thing, you know, because they're gonna give me too much problem. So I kind of just step out of the band thing and just say, well, you know, uh, I'm gonna just deal with it my way, you know. Mm. Mm. Because yeah. you you ended up in in what was what is what was known as the um, the Bible at the time, the Black Echoes. Yeah, and I, and I believe there's a there's a story that you can tell us about when you were doing your nine till five, <laughs> and you discovered. Uh, where you were in the charts. Do you want to tell us about that? Yeah. Well, um, I was doing a nine to five them time there, you know, and I was like um, working for a car rental firm. So me, the boss, and an next co worker, we traveling to go and um, pick up some cars and bring them back to the depot. And the, them stop at the paper shop buy cigarette or whatever so me come out now and go to the paper shop and me see them sell echoes you know because it's not every shop did sell echoes them time there mm -hmm. see them black echoes <coughs> so me see the echoes and me just buy it and go back in the car and them I drive and me I look through the echoes and me go so bam so I'm looking at the charts and me see me down number five <laughs> and me kind of shock now because I never mean, know some me down number five in a, in, a, in a charts you know Mm. So I'm said to myself, watch out, that number five. See, and so everybody in the car now, I said, what, what, what do you mean you're number five? I said, I'm number five in the, in the, the reggae charts. See, and then I said, no, that's not you. And you know, them are going on them way, and them can't believe, see, I mean, and thing. Well, you're working alongside them. They're not going to think they're sitting next to Vivian Love Jones. There's no <laughs> way. Well, they never know that, because uh -huh. I'm going to walk on and tell people, see, it was nothing when I walk around and say, oh, me a singer, and me a this. Them, them uh -huh. things never come in my head. See? Yeah. Me just love singing, love writing tune, love go studio and make tune. That was my thing. See? And uh -huh. when I do my nine to five, you know, me never have a business <laughs> the world, boy. You know, me not get no pay half my music. Mm. Is, this, is this where the disillusionment came in about the musical industry, though? Is this where, the, where you became disillusioned with it all? After that, because after that, it's like so the man them start. Um, I was making songs for producer, and me and my musician them go in there and make all some tune, you know. See, and them tune they come out to be mega tune, even right now. Them tune they still in a history as some great tune, see. And the thing about it is that we never know nothing about a put out record, right. We never know nothing about, you know, press record, labels and all them something. We never very interested in that. You're, you're just an artist, isn't it? You're just... You, you're yeah, not... man, we just love and do the thing. Mm -hmm. See? So, then comes the producer, man. Who, well, him is not the real producer. You know? We are the producer. Him is the man who pay the money for the studio. See? The studio time and everything. And for press the record and print. I feel money. Him spend all the money on that. So him never come ask us about um, um, who is the producer and, and, and writer or anything. Him would just go down and him would just put on written, arranged, produced by him. Mm. Mm. And, the night when, and the night when we had to do this, the, the tuning at the studio, him in our corner over there, so I sleep. Mm. And when the session done, and I wake him up and say, yo, the tune done, you know. He said, me hear it. You know? Mm. But the tune said, and them man they have the control because them are press the tune and them are make the label and everything. Them put for them name on it. Mm. And some of them people, you know, them get big out of this thing, you know. Them get rated big as some big producer, you know. But them never produce no tune in them life. Now I tell you that. Because that's that that's when you is that when you decided frig this and I'm going back to Jamaica. Yeah, man. And because them used to say me is a fiesty youth, you know. So, because most of them man, they held the man to me and thing, you know, and, and when you turn around and tell them, say, well, boy, watch, you know, I do sing no more tune for you, you know. I don't sing no more tune for you because you don't pay me no money and you don't give me no money for my work. So, move on, go. Uh -huh. so, you're a fierce to you. So, uh -huh. 
What them do now, you know, to try and flap you even further, you know. Them go around and tell them other producer friend them and thing and people in the business. Say that you they are fierce to you. Don't do not tune with that you there. Mm, so they're blackballing you. They try a black Yeah, they them are try do. So me just decide say, you know what? Oh, God, Jamaica, I go back to my yard, go go spend some time with my grandparents, they will grow me up and them thing. Man. So it's you know? back to the grandparents. Back to the yeah. grandparents. Yeah, man, I want to you, man, the sweetest wife that. Mm, car, car. Me know, me know, me know you and and the sweetest vibe and going back home, you know. <laughs> <laughs> when you say the sweetest vibe, and y'all go back home, you know, because there's all these um, images of you, um, you know, as as you're coming through as a young man, yeah. you know, yeah. and you're you're bucking up against an industry now. Mm. Um, that's 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 controlling you and telling you what it wants you to do and you've got a clear idea and identity of, of who you are because the one thing that really does stand out about you as i said to you earlier on is your demeanor your actual demeanor it's very i would you know i would i will put it alongside um the cool ruler mr gregory isaacs yeah man, one of my one of my artists them that me me pay attention to enough as a youth growing up, you know. Yeah. You know? Cause when I when I walk when I watch you walk to the stage, when I watch the way you pick up the mic, no rush, nobody now push me up here, me I come up here, come me one come up here the way me one come up here. <laughs> Yeah, and, you know, the greatest artist them, you know, is the artist them were natural, you know. Mm. The greatest artist them, you look on any one of them and the way them just walk on the stage. And if you see them in, in, in person, you know, are the same thing you go and see when them go up on the stage, you know. And um, me's a man like this. I always try to be myself at all time. I don't want to be like no one else, you know. Yeah. I'm always that, you know. Yeah, because you never really, um, when you went, I mean, even looking at your style, you've never really adopted the whole um, tear up clothes, shabaranks kind of like movement. Even when um, those youths then was busting true, you always had a suit, a hat, you know, very gentleman like. Is that also a reflection of your grandparents? Yes, most definitely. Because any of my family, them, you see, I wear a felt hat. See, them get it from my grandfather, whether it's them father, because some of my uncle, them, 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 them also wear felt on. Because that is the way the man in a full family grow we up. Okay. That's the way him stay. So you always try to, you, you always, you just have that as a natural thing for you, you know? Uh -huh. it, it just happened because that's how you say. I always tell people, say, well, boy, I come from an elegant family. Mm -hmm. See, whether it's grandfather, grandmother, mother, father, aunties, uncles, cousin, the whole away. When you see one away, you will know, you will see it, you know, because there's a time and a place for everything. Okay. Okay. Um... I don't know what happened there, but um, Norman just fell out. I'll just bring him back in. Is there, is there, is there any questions that you might want to ask um, Vivian, by the way, as you hear Norman? Can you hear us, Norman? Um, yeah, I can hear you. Um, I can't really ask no questions right now because um, my phone kicked out, so I didn't. You know, I was, <laughs> I was in the conversation for at least uh, ten minutes. So, I know uh, that's fine. That's fine. But, that's fine. Um, all I want to say is, yeah, well, what I want to say is one of my favorite tunes of um, Vivian is um, Strong Love. Strong yeah. Love. Because you know what? People people have been biling out, biling out. Give me, give me, give yeah, me. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, people have been biling out saying, make him sing a tune, make him sing a tune, <laughs> make him sing a tune. And I said to them, you know what? <laughs> yeah. He's coming here to be interviewed. He's not coming here to come sing the tune for Una. They're like, no, man, make you sing, make you sing. 
Well, what I also love about you, Vivian, is you've, you've kept up with the times, yeah? And yeah. I can show people what me mean. Hey, this is Vivian Jones. It's your child and crosses, child and crosses. Oh, you see the child and crosses, child and crosses, Jones. If you want someone to mind you, you better go on and left me. If you want someone to love you, hey, come in, come check me. Check me. I never born to be no one prisoner. prisoner. Hey, I mean, no one, no one, if they come, come rule me. Rule me, Jones. <laughs> Them used to laugh when me go to school and say me born town fool. <laughs> You can't take me for no boo boo. Uh, and then you treat me like doo doo. Hey. Now I'm gonna make you. You come, come tie me. Because you give me a little something. Now I'm gonna make you. You come control me. Over the little bit of boo boo. Yes, we have some good times. Jones. It never lasts no long time. Long time. I remember when the singer man said, It takes time to know you. Yeah. A mama look into his eyes and say, hey, Takes time to know you. Vivian Jones. I'm in a one a hole carrying on my life. Every day you need fixing. Say you want to break shoes, you want to break light. And nothing I run right. Wipe on our work, treat me like jerk. I must say, want me leave her. Now I'm going to make you. See, I just tease them. May I just tease them, Vivian? May I tease them? <laughs> May I tease them. May I bring out your velvet voice, make them see it, you know? <laughs> but they've been balling, balling for you to sing. Um, what, 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 drop one or two lines for them, you know? Um, yeah. <laughs> it's definite the thing for me, as sure as I can be. It's a strong love, and yeah, although we haven't known each other very long, yeah, the feeling strong, and we can't go wrong all because of the strong love. We Nobody give them no more. Nobody give them no more. Make them stay there. Make them stay there. Nobody give them no more. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us, sir, because the thing is, is that you went, oh, you went, you went, you went back to Jamaica and you started working with um the Jamaican producers out there as well, yeah. Uh, yeah. such as Bobby Digital and Junior Reed. Um, yeah, I also, I also spend my money on book a session in Channel One Studio. Mm -hmm. And did um, some wonderful works with um, Roots Radix, original Roots Radix band. Okay. At the studio. And um, basically, I really wanted to test myself and see how my sound amongst my Jamaican and them, bridging them, you know? Mm -hmm. See him coming in from after my start my trade at England. So, you know. So when I go to Jamaica, I want to test myself. I'm going to do a couple of songs with Roots Radix. And them give me the biggest big up. Them, okay. man, them, them man, them give me the biggest forward and said, the man them said to me, say, oh, you come in a studio and I go and like say, I don't know what you do. <laughs> you hear the tune, what you just make. Uh -huh. my, youth, my youth just fix up, man, your bad. And the man them give me the biggest big up, man, a Channel One studio, Maxfield Avenue, you know? Yeah. Okay, okay. Because Denise Francis says that she met you. Um, she's not sure if you'll recall meeting her. Um, but she said that you're a very humble man and you never knew me, but you did me two jingles without hesitation. <laughs> and I will never forget that. And thank you. Yeah, man. Bless up yourself, Denise, you know. Always a pleasure, you know. She said it was exactly the same way uh, my jingles sounded. So... She's saying that your 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 voice, because a lot of people go into the studio and they you them just play around with the key, the um with the, the mixing desk. Is that what you call it? <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. But e you know, they do EQs and and frequency and yeah and and, and voice box and all them things there. You know, 
Yeah. Where yeah. your voice is your voice. Yeah, man. You, you know, know, always, if I write a song, you know, I, I go and sing it in my house uh, before I even go to the studio and, and I'm singing it in, a, in, in the house. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I, 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 I know that, so, well, boy, yes, this is how my voice is supposed to sound and whatever. So by the time you go into the studio now, with all the equipment, you it enhance, enhance your voice even more. Okay. Uh, and, and, you know, give you a, a, a more sweeter song. You know, but sometimes I even go in and I will tell the engineer, say, yo, you know, I want it natural, you know, just just left my voice natural. Just you know. So you just sing and the same way like oh you're not singing in a yard, you sing it in the studio and just, you know, it's just it's just EQs and thing and and effects. Okay. You know, it, it needs to put on and if you don't have no effects or no EQ, it doesn't matter because you have delivered the vocal at the right level and tone and pitch and everything you know okay well tell us about tell us about your relationship with um jetstar and mr palmer no yeah well, mr palmer a uh, big respect every time me um for call mr palmer name i will always say big respect mr p and then we can go and talk and think mm -hmm. see because mr palmer uh, encourage me from before me start sing because I used to buy records from Mr. Palmer in a in shop down at uh, Craven Park. Mm -hmm. See, when it was Palmer records be even before Jetstar come along. Okay. But, you know, same time I was a school youth. See, and Mr. Palmer who, who used to even say, Well, boy, if I come in and I want a certain amount of tune and the money, the money now, they have to cover the whole of tune. He said, All right, you take them two there. And next week, you come back and you pay me for those two. See? So we build up a, a, a wonderful relationship there from youth days. And Mr. Palmer always called me youth. Okay. Always called me youth. He said, youth, I go on youth. <laughs> yes, Mr. P, you know, and thing. Uh -huh. and so when I started to sing, you know, and I met my, one of my first tune, see, and, and, and the producer bring me down to me, Jetstar now. Because them time you know, it was Jetstar, you now it moved from Palmer to Jetstar. Mm -hmm. So the producer bring me down to Mr. P. And so when I go in, Mr. P. So what are you, what you doing here? See? And then is the producer I turn on to Mr. P. and say, Well, Mr. P., this is the man who sing the tune, you know, Vivian Jones. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. P. I say, Youth? Yeah. Youth, you sing? You sing youth? <laughs> so, yeah, Mr. P. I'm my, I'm my I might have that one. I was say, him can't believe, say, you know, all the time they must see me and I buy a tune from him from my girl's school. And he couldn't believe, say, oh boy, I me, I sing tune and I sing such a wicked tune. And, mm. and after that, him just start give me certain guidance and thing, you know, see? Okay. Because even when me follow to Mr. Palmer, me and him follow, man, we never talk for all about a month. Uh -huh. See? And and him and one day him just called me and him said, um, I need you to come see me, youth. Come and see me. He said, All right, Mr. P. I'm going and see him. And him said, Right. I want you to sing this song for me. I want you to go and, and go into the studio and do this song for me. Mm. See him? And him give me the record, and give me a, a, a cassette with the, the tune on it. Seeing what he wanted me to sing, and the tune was a sing, was a song near my arm. It's amazing how you can speak right to my heart. And cause you say it best okay. when you say nothing okay. at all. Sorry, people, I had to join in with him. I know that people are cussing me for singing along. <laughs> yeah. See, Mr. Palmer called me and I'm saying would I like me to sing this tune because it would do a a album, you know, with the UK artists, them are cover some of these pop songs. Uh -huh. Name pop beats in a reggae. See? And going on, boom. See? And I can tell you our next incident, you know, one day me, me, me put my, me, me put my hammer in on my car boot, you know. See? And I'm going to look for one of them producer man there, you know. Mm. And me never see him. So I drive go down a jet star now and 
And I walk in at the place and I say, Paul, I see me and him said, him say, what to you? What do your face look like that? I said, Mr. P, you see that man there? The man there, you know, if I do that tune, the man there, he give me a penny and I have that tune. I look, I go look for him. He said, you do what? He said, come upstairs. Okay. I go in the office with the man. When I go upstairs in the office, he said to me, he said, you are a number one singer. Do you think this is the way that number one singer behave? Yeah, all right, all you right. To lick the man? Don't Don't tell me you hear, let me hear you say anything like that. You're a number one singer. And you have to show respect to your your, your trade and it's a poem I give to me man and really give me a lecture the day man and I try I show him say you know the reason why I want to see this money is because of a boy owe my money and my dodge me and thing you know so it's a poem I just take out him receipt book and just write up a thing and just give me your money you know me and boom and say go and pay your bills. And don't let me hear you talk about nothing about you going to lick down, man. <laughs> I, think, I think what was confusing for a lot of people, um, Vivian, was that you sang in falsetto. Yeah. And the name was also Vivian. Yeah. So them think it's a, a, a female, you know? Mm -hmm. Some people think it's a female. I can tell you I did a Lover's Rock show, a big Lover's Rock show down at Brixton Academy. Um. The late, the late great Castro Brown put on that show. Mm. Uh, even Karen Wheel and Jazzy B and okay, you know, all the the the, the, the lovers rock singers, all the singers them in the UK with number one show. Okay, so we was all on that show, massive show. And um, when I came out to do my set, I started with Sugar Love. And I care, and the second tune was Good Morning. And when we bust out the Good Morning, the world place uproar, the world place mash up. Yeah. And the thing about it is that a lot of people didn't realize say, the same person who sing um, Good Morning are the same person who sing Sugar Love, Strong uh -huh. Love, uh -huh. Extra Classic, The Earth. They didn't uh -huh. realize it was the same person who sing the good morning because the good morning singing a falsetto. And that just come about, you know, natural because um, I remember when Junior Mervyn do um, uh, um, Police and Thief. Uh -huh. Yes, I was, yes. I was singing that song like, like it's my song, you know? Mm -hmm. And I never even realized, say, well, boy, this falsetto thing, yeah, they know me. So it's one morning and um, I look through my window and see a, a nice young lady I pass my window and I start singing, Good morning, how you doing? Good morning, good morning, how you doing? I just start singing that. Right. Boom, in that right. the evening, the evening we have rehearsal. See? And them days there, when we go in a rehearsal, we just decide what we are going to do, you know? Uh -huh. So we just go in a rehearsal and we say, well, well, I have a tune, you know. I have a new tune. See him? And we just get together with the musician, you know, and we start singing, you know, man start chopping guitar and find the cards, them you know, and bass man pick up a line and drummer start playing. And, and that was good morning. See wow. him? Wow. That was good morning. I saw good morning come out and we just go lick that. We go in a studio, we'll lick that tune there and you know, that tune sit about for about a year. Cause we licked that 1978. Okay. And that never released till 1979. Okay. Yeah, yeah cause I didn't know it in the in the early 70s. I knew it a bit yeah. later. Yeah, man. That never touched road until um, is our next bridge in our mind and come and say, "What we not do with the tune? Come on, get the tape and we could go mix the tune, man." And Kerry McGowan once through the way out in a um, um, was it um. Suffolk or some place mm. out like Bush and um some 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 the brother them who won the studio was some kind of LZ Angels people them. Raw. But them on my bridging was them them on my bridging was friends, good friends. So them tell him say he must bring the thing to the studio, man. And I tell you, even to this day, it's one of the most beautiful studio me ever going up. Okay. It was like a barn, you know. 
and um, pure wood and, you know, beautiful. And yeah, man, and this is how we mix the good morning. And then a man take it to Bridge and take it to um, Count Shelley. Right. And Count Shelley done in North London and Count Shelley said, This tune, you're bad, man. And press the tune and I remember Sugar Mine that was at number one for about six months with a mm -hmm. tune named African Girl. Yeah. Oh, and all yeah. that, you know, the tune couldn't come from number one. I'm mean, there number, number two for about six months with Good Morning. Uh -uh. Until finally, you know, oh. book and the Good man, Good Morning take the number one spot. See? And them time to me have the nine to five still in my lap. See? No, I'm feeling yeah. that. I'm feeling that. So, yeah. so what what was the relationships like when you then started to do duets with Sylvia Teller, Debbie Gordon, and Deborah Glasgow? What was that like? That's a nineties we are talking about now. Yeah, we are jump, we are jump. Yeah, 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 that's a nineties we are talking about. Nineties we are talking about with them times, you know. See, because you know? I know I just missed out the whole Jashaka years, yeah. Yeah, you missed out all the years. You missed out all the eighties. Well, then, then 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 we can jump back. We can jump back because I know we can talk about the album. Um, your debut album, Bank Rob Bank Robbery, mm -hmm. in '84. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. And and them time there was the Shaka era too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's just Shaka called me for to um do an album with him, and he said that me are the first artist out of England him ever record. Is it? Yeah, man. There's a scoop for everybody in the room. There's a scoop. <laughs> yeah, man. You're the first, you're the first artist out of the UK Shaka ever record. So I've got the, I've got a first, I've got a first in terms of an author, and now I've got a first in terms of working with Jashaka. That's yeah, a scoop yeah. for me. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, because even after Jashaka record, me record Aswad, um, and a few other, uh, other artists, them, you know. Uh -huh. Along the line, but me know so me I was me was the first, and him tell me that because in a them days they never really do rate the England artists them so much, you know. See, but because of the tunes them I was making, uh -huh. and Shaka was playing those tunes, uh -huh. you know, tunes like Who's Gonna Get Caught, Flashy Tanguan, you know, Third World Man, them are some big international roots and culture tune them tune me, mm -hmm. see. And most people in like England don't even know that. No, a lot, of us, a lot of us don't know that. But the thing is, is that you went from the Lovers Rock and then you went back to the Roots music, though, didn't you? That's what no, you're man, you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not go back to no Roots. Well, you are, it's roots, always there. Yeah, 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 yeah. A Roots me started because I come from the original foundation of even from, from Black Hawk mm -hmm. Studio, Lee Perry, seeing Cloak and Anchor and all them, uh, Cloak and Dagger. Yeah. See, um Jack Ruby Burning Spear. See? Um original Wheelers, Joe Higgs. And them place them me personally a, 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 a step in this thing you're from. You know? And then because of um the dance hall and, and, and the the parties, house parties and thing. You yeah, but the house, the house part is what is the lovers rock though. That's the thing though. Because we no nah, man, before lovers rock come in, waiting to so them when I play at house party. House yeah, party before that, party. everybody was skanking and everything. I, I nah, not yeah. Yeah. Man, like, everything wrong, man. I rub up when I go on, man. I walk into you. Wait, what was going on in Birmingham at the time, though? What was going on in Birmingham at the time? Rub up, rub up in a blues dance. Wait, hold on, yeah, yeah, yeah. Blues dance. hold on, Birmingham never come out of the uh, out of the blues dance. Birmingham was still stuck in the early ages. From what oh, we my God. when you talk about blues dance, no, see, uh -huh. you talk about Alton Ellis, you talk yes. about um, John Holt, you talk about, about, about any one of the greats, them Dennis, you know, Freddie, you talk about the whole of them, man, you talk about this man, Decker, you talk about yo, you can go as far as you want to go with this scene. Mm -hmm. Because them days it was everything in other dance in other blues dance. Everything in our blues dance. Okay. See? Okay. It was a full circle. It was not just no lovers rock or no the roots thing or nothing. It uh -huh. was a full circle thing. See? All right, so, I'll give you the history. Yeah, I give you the history. Yeah, yeah, man. So so when we are going up, because see my 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 family them you know, is between London and Birmingham, you know. My Please don't. Them, 
Eh? Please don't big up Birmingham, but go on. Thank you, man. I can big up Birmingham any day of the week, any time. All my Birmingham massive them, yo. Anyhow, I'm tuning in. Big up on yourself, see him? Because I don't know some yeah, yes. one away. Yeah? Oh, yeah. yeah. So it go with me and Birmingham. And I would say the same thing about Sheffield, Leeds, Bradford, Manchester. See him? I would say that about any one of them places there, see him? Yeah, because but the thing is, the thing is, if I'm correct, if I'm correct now, once you, yeah. once you put together the Imperial House label, yeah, yeah, it, you know, that's you know, that's you really hitting the road hard now, isn't it? Yeah, well, that's me deciding to well, boy, end up producer thing. Me going to deal with my thing now, record company, record label, seeing um, presentation of the artist. Mm -hmm. Seeing everything, oh, I want to be presented. Seeing whether it's on a record sleeve or it's going on stage or wherever, I am in charge. Okay. So you see, from I take up that thing there, seeing 1991, from I take up that, seeing everything just flourish, everything just start bloom, you know. You got names. Yeah, you, you in charge of your own destiny. Best male artist you got in 1991 in British Reggae, in the British British Reggae Industry Awards, if I'm correct. That was 91. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But a whole heap of work did go on even before that because uh, we get um, best single. See, in 1988. See, we get best album. See, in 1990. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. so Wooly Patune hits in that, in that time because Sugar Love was 1988. Okay. So Extra Classic was 1989. The Earth was 1990. See? Um, 1992, 91, we have a big tune on Sensitivity. See? Yeah, that. that was one of my favorites. That was one of my favorites. Right. See? Yes. And that's one of the first cover tune where me, cover, a cover song where me ever really hit with. Okay. Because all of the other songs then was original Vivian Jones songs. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us, tell us, tell us, a, tell us a little bit more about your writing, because mm -hmm. we heard how you said "Good Morning" came about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tell mm -hmm. us about some of the other tracks um, and the inspiration behind some of those tracks. Well, all of them kind of speak for themselves, you know. Because even if you take "Sugar Love," you know, "Sugar Love" is a song I write, but you know. Um, McQueen, you know, at mm -hmm. the time, you know, we did it and boom, I and mean, I said, boy, I said, love you, I sweet like sugar, so boom, we just sing, I said, sugar love, sugar love, boom, and I eat that, you know, see, okay. It? Okay. and when it comes to, it, 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 it's not even just for say, well, boy, you just hold a punchline and go on, because if you listen to sugar love and listen to what I'm saying in other song, seeing. You were over, I said, it's a nice and wonderful thing I go on, relationship. Yeah, relationship, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, and if you go to um, Extra Classic, I the same thing I'll talk. Mm. You, know? Mm. you know, I think you're Extra Classic, super fantastic, you know? Because I had that on cassette, believe it or not. I had it on cassette, not CD, you know? Yeah, man. I had it on cassette, blood. Like. Mm -hmm. Well, them days, cassette, when we come out of the studio, everything we have it on cassette or that. That tape, you know, mm -hmm. are real to real. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So talk. Let's 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 get to the girls, man, because the duets that you did with Sylvia Teller and Debbie Gordon and Deborah Garsgård. Let's talk about some of the girls that you did the duets with. Yeah, well, it's something. It's, it's a thing that me like still, you know. I love to do duets, you know, especially like if me um, um and my duets them was always singer when I have high ratings for you know. Mm -hmm. You know, if me hear them a sing, I know me hear them a sing, I love them voice and thing. I say, yes, I could do a tune, you know. You know, because even me coming from a, 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 even a Motown background too, you know. Okay. You know, enough of them things there. Because Vivian Jones listen to all type of music, you know, seeing, except um, them classical music and them things. I'm not too into that, seeing, and them something there. Mm -hmm. Opera and them something there. I'm not doing them something there. Mm -hmm. See, but music with beat and melody and 
and rhythm, you know. And, and my thing that even some music with just are just sweet voice and little acoustic and them things that I love, I love all them things there, see? But as I say, coming from a background where my mother and father, them always listen to good music. Okay. Classic singers, see? Quality singers, your Otis Redding, your Sam Cooke, your Nat King Cole, you know, you, 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 you name them. I mean, Nat King Cole's diction was perfect. It, well, effortless singer too. If a man want to check how singing go, you know, mm -hmm. check a man there. You know, we call it effortless. You know, that everything, that means that things just come out of you. It's not you are trying to blow it out. Mm -hmm. It just flows out of you, you know, mm -hmm. them kind of thing there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I growing up listening to those singers, you know, and, um, even when me never know, say, boy, I can't sing, me I sing. See? Okay. I mean, I always I sing, man. When I wasn't growing up in Jamaica, you know, before I even leave the island and come to England, you know, I used to be walking <laughs> towards, um, like, my grandma gate down the road and, and I sing. Mm -hmm. You know, because, I mean, when I come to England now, I mean, I walk down the road and I sing now. People think I'm a madman. You see okay. what I say? But I'm not surprised. I'm but not people surprised. never see the people never see it like that in Jamaica, you know. No, but, but they were always singing. I mean, we I mean, as 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 an oppressed people, we always sang and we always try to take the beauty out of um suppression and depression. I mean, here's something that um I just want to spoil everybody with. People going into a trance when they listen to them tune there. I think people going into a trance when they listen to them tune there. <laughs> it's nice because, like you said, it's effortless. You know, it's got an international feel to it because I mean, you had that international hit um, in the nine, in the late nineties, I think it was. With just see them coming, just see them are come. Yeah, yeah, man, yeah. And that was produced by the great Hooligan Mabridge, you know, out of Birmingham. Seriously? Oh, yeah, man, man, the great Hooligan producer tune, man. And I want to tell you, say, I want my favorite producer that like, because every tune me ever sing for him is a hit song. See? Okay. Every tune me ever sing for him. And some of them sang the All America. Is America them tune the hit? I don't know what kind of connection him did have with America, but theme tune them always sing for hit America, you know? Mm. Yeah. Mm. 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 I see all the women in the in there going moist at the right right about now, man. They're just woo! Stop teasing, <laughs> Rudy! Stop teasing! <laughs> always, always a pleasure, man. See, because no, some man. of these some of these people have been listening to me for years, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and they still are listening to me all now. So, give thanks, man. Truly, mm -hmm. give thanks, you know. Mm. So um the 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 the, the what's it, I can see here that in 2007 you released um the album 50th featuring yeah. old rhythms from producers such as Bunny Lee yeah. to, to celebrate your 50th man what yeah, was that like man, man. some great rhythms because I never know 
know, say one day I, I would have lived for sing upon some of them rhythm that I was dancing to mm -hmm. in my teens. Mm -hmm. Some of those artists were singing upon them rhythm there. You know, I was a teenager dance to them tune there and thing. Mm -hmm. So it was such a great pleasure to get the opportunity to provide some of them tune there. And um, yeah, some that was a that's a wonderful LP, and I did that to celebrate my fiftieth birthday. You know. Do you mind me asking how old are you now, Vivian? Sixty-three. Ross Clark. I've said that. I've said that, Vlad. I've said that. Give thanks. I'm glad I even said that. You know I mean? <laughs> said give thanks, Vlad. You have to give thanks, man. It's yeah. really, it's really been uh, a pleasure um, talking to you, Vivian, as well as um, yourself, Norman. I've, I've never ever anybody who's been on my platform before um, will confirm. I've never ever. Um, run an interview to two hours. Never yeah. ever. This is a first. Never. This is a never. first. This is the first never, time. Never. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yes. Okay. Never ever. Never yeah, ever yeah. run it. Yeah, never, man, you have to the first, so you don't know how to say it. Go on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's so the first and the piece. first. We have two firsts. Eh? So, <laughs> the first and the first. I'm yes. a born for the first. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Yeah, man. Lord have mercy. The first I hear for born, man. The okay. same date as my, you have the same date as my sister. All right, big girl, big girl. She must be a wonderful person. I know that she is. She is definitely. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen yeah. in the chat room and all those people who have been watching on YouTube, thank you very much for tuning in with me. Um, I'd like to just for the next five minutes or so um, have you throw up any questions that you would like to have. Norman or um, Vivian answer for you. Um, I know you're giving them a lot of accolades and I know and, and I appreciate all of that, but I would, I would appreciate if there were any questions that you'd like me to put forward to them that I can do that for you over the next five minutes. It would be much appreciated. Because um, we, we've been spoiled tonight. We really have been spoiled tonight. Minali, because I know Vivian was busy watching the football. Had to go again. <laughs> what match was you watching? Tottenham and, uh, and Tottenham and Wickham, you know? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, man, Wickham put up a good fight, but, you know? Yeah, they lost. <laughs> yeah, man, Tottenham, Tottenham. You never see the end of it, but we know Tottenham, they gone three, you know? Uh, and what is your, your, your... team? Yeah. Is that no, your son. team? No, nah, man, I just love watch football, you know? My team, I'm, I'm Manchester United, man. <laughs> stop it, man. Stop it, stop it, stop it. Uno got lucky the other day. Uno got lucky. You lot caught us, because I'm a Liverpool, I'm a Liverpool man. You lot caught us when we're wounded. That's all I'm have to say. You lot caught us when we're wounded. You can't talk anything you want to talk. You can't talk nothing. You can't talk anything you want to talk. I think you have that, man. That's the game. <laughs> you know? There is a question there for you, Vivian. Yeah. Uh who would you like to duet with next? Um, Carl Thompson. Carol, okay. Yeah, man, my friend Carl Thompson, one queen, we respect her enough, and and what well, always a pleasure for work, Mum Sarah and him with, you know. I'd like to do a tune with her and our Sandra Cross, any one of them. They are professional artists, them very good singers, you know, I'm rate them, you know. So then what was it like working with Orlando then when Orlando put on the um the Lovers Rock team? Not a problem, man. I, I love work for you, man. Anytime I'm calling me, man, as long as the date available, man. Mm -hmm. I love work with Orlando, man. Big up yourself, Orlando. I hope you're tuning and thing right now. So, you know, big up yourself. Long time I don't see you. Must give a call. I call you your name call. I must give a call. Because mm. that's a mm. big name, that's a big, big name promoter. Yeah, uh, man, I have biggest respect for that brother, the man, for, to him. see what him do mm -hmm. and the way him do him thing, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, for him thing are some quality thing, and I love quality. Mm. Well, yeah, like, like the clothes you wear, everything is quality when it comes to you, um, Vivian. I have yeah, to say man. that. Um, Claire Tong is asking, she's actually saying and asking a question at the same time. Looking good for 63, Vivian. What's your secret? And nobody says smoking weed. No, 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 no. That, that tease you. 
that come natural, but it's not the smoking of the weed, it's drinking the tea. Okay. Yeah, man, drink the tea, man. Are you referring to bush tea or are you talking about PG tips? PG tip on a bush tea, man. Mm, mm, PG mm. tip on milk tea. Uh -huh. I think uh -huh. I put some natural herbs and, and things, fever grass and you know, all them kind of things there, eh? all some Guinean root and all them things there. Eh? Uh -huh. But most of all, ganja leaf them, um, put them in a pot and boil them and cut up some ginger with it and, you know, whatever else you want, put around it and a natural tea that, man. You hear, you hear that, people? Natural tea, yeah? Good for your body, good for your health, you know? You for you for no you for no waffle but when when you're boiling stuff you for no waffle bile. <laughs> yeah. yeah man, see it there man. You for no are you that are you that Vivian? <laughs> yeah man, see it there man. Happiness. Yeah. Oh, well. you know? <laughs> <laughs> when you boil it, you must know what for bile. That's how that's that's how I'll be um, yeah, I think I think Viv, um Denise, you know, she's saying, Vivian, do you still uh Carve out pipes. We met at Errol G's. Does that ring a bell? Because I know you've met millions of people. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. I still carve out my pipe. I still have one right now. I have one right now and I'm at hand. All right. All right. I think, you put a, I think you put a smile on her face. <laughs> what has been the biggest change you have had in the last five decades? Whoa, that's a big question, Judy. It's a nice question, by the way. Biggest change. Yeah. Well, the biggest change is right now. Okay. Not being able to work and earn a living and them things there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that the biggest change right now in all the decades. You know? Because we never think so well, boy. Man going on lockdown music. Oh, you feel lockdown music. Music make people live. Music is life, you know? See? So... Yeah. I mean, I just lock down thing. I'm not really too united, you know, because that I got arm more people than than yeah, than same, same yeah, people, you know? yeah. Because the, there's there's mental issues that are not really um yeah. being dealt with when it when all it, when it issues, man. All heap of issues. People, who you tell people can't pay them rent, and you know, I've nowhere to live and all them thing there and all them kind of thing. There are more stress on the on the on the population yeah. and. and you know, people yeah. don't get looked after because of them help, because of them I said this and that, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, it all it's not it's not right, but you know, what we can do, we just have to go on and wait for the higher heights. There's a question here for you, Norman. Um, do you ever ponder what would have been rotted in far off him cheer? Yeah, all right now, man. I'm the, uh, I'm, I'm here. I'm me all right. Me all right. Yeah, drink bush tea. Yeah, drink bush tea. Well, go on. Well, go on. No. <laughs> <laughs> do you, um, yeah, well, Norman? Do you ever ponder what would what would have been if you, have, if you if you had have taken up the offer to change your characters to white characters to get the book never. made into a play and possibly a film? No, never pondered that whatsoever. I start. I. I. I I stayed real to what I do and what I am. So no, I never pondered that whatsoever. No regrets. Oh, respect, bro. Respect for that. Um, there's a question here for you, um, Vivian. This is coming from um, when I, whenever I play my credits, um, Nevada Keita, he actually produced and wrote and, uh, and um, arranged my in and my, my outro and my intro. To, to my show. But his question to you is, he used to be part of Arima. You most probably know Nevada, Kato. Um, mm -hmm. His question is, I think the last time we met was in the Royal Lounge a couple of years ago when I was with my former group, Arima. I'm in love with you, darling. I know Arima. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. And if you look, good at the, if you look good at the face, you most, he's currently in Sweden. He's currently living in Sweden. Mm-hmm. He's currently living in Sweden. Um, yes, yeah, man. Big up yourself, Navar. Big up yourself. See, it? yeah, man. Uh, DJ Fridge is also Fridge uh, UK. Say Vivian is is a reggae 
is a reggae great, deserves the highest respect, very good performer on stage. So more accolades, more accolades. I grabbed the accolades, but I'm asking if there are any questions that you'd like to ask um, our two gentlemen here. Because as you know, I'm now I've done two hours and nine minutes, which I don't normally do. Norman, are you still writing? And are you writing anything about the situation we are in now? Is a question um, for you. Oh, not, uh, not um, actually writing about what's happening now, but um, I am working on two two books that I, 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 I said uh, when I was mentioning to you yesterday, I got six books in my head, but I'm working on two at the moment. So um, I haven't really um, thought about writing anything about what's happening now because, uh, <laughs> you know, I, yeah, who, knows what's I mean, gonna who knows what's going to happen in the future, you know? That's true. That's true. Carl is based in um, in Wales, and he says, Vivian knows one of my favourite tracks is Good Morning. I had it on um, C90 cassette, and it took him years to get it on vinyl. Wow, go on, that's a man. Mm -hmm. That's how it go, you know? That's how it go with them, with, with them classic there, you know? Mm. Really because I was in discussion just the other day about re-releasing that song. Okay. Yeah, so um we've got it in mind you know okay and um with that on the last note being said by um mr vivian jones i would like to thank the both of you for um coming on my platform tonight um can we get some applause please for the gentlemen who have um sat down and opened up to you guys just a, a few round of applause i'd like to bring them up on screen so they can see them just as, as a way of saying thank you, because um, as you know, you know, me, 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 bro, me, bro, me now appear them and then I, I come support me. So I'm going to have to say thank you to, um, to the both of you um, for oh, that. I'm going to tell you something I'm saying in the bill. <laughs> Shut up, man. <laughs> <laughs> Is Norman originally from Birmingham or London? Birmingham, man. Birmingham. Mm. I'm a Birmingham mm. boy. He's a Birmingham boy. Okay, that's cool. That's cool. Uh, Keith Bradley is saying, "Sugar love are the greatest." Yes, Sugar love. Man. Give thanks for that, yo, Caitlin. More so, you're saying. No way. Okay, and um, thank you both so much. Um, Antigua, is saying, Antigua is saying, "Awesome evening of pure entertainment and enlightenment." Talented and blessed. Salute Norman and Vivian. Oh, and well done, Rudy. Oh, you've noticed that I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those people who are out there. Thank you. I, I, <laughs> I can't think of a, a, a better way of um, ending tonight, ladies and gentlemen. I will be playing some promos. Um, so, gentlemen, please, 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 please don't disappear. The promos are going to be, by the time this is finished playing, um, it may be about 10 to 12 minutes. Um, but before I go, um, would you like to say goodbye, gentlemen? Yeah. Vivian? Yeah, man. No, you go first, Norman. <laughs> I go first. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, well, thanks for having me, uh, inviting me to the program. And um, God bless everybody. Stay safe and well. And please, let's not forget, we are going to now start a campaign to get those books back to you. All right. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's going to be in my Ransom Band show. It's going to be in my Keep It Real show. It's going to be on my Anything Goes podcast. It's going to be on 15 Minutes with Rudy Liquid and DJ Countryman. I will be biling about this. Uh, I, will I, do, I will tune in. I do have certain um, people like Julie Juice, who I'm sure, and um, Denise Francis, as well as... Um, Awesome. Countryman, I'll get in touch with Countryman as well to try and, you know, organise something so that we can get those books back to you so we can turn wow. them into a play. I think I think that okay. needs to be done. That needs to be done. Okay. Um, Vivian, right. would you like to say goodbye, sir? Yeah, man. Enough respect and love. See, to everyone who tune in and take the time out, you know, and listen to it. And, yeah, man, just keep the faith and keep strong. See, don't let go. Yeah. See, 
Okay, mm, so you must, give be, that. must be a better way. You know, better must come. See? For real, All right. Respect, and respect. Salute. Salute. Nice meeting you, Vivian. If you want someone to mind, you better go on and let me. If you want someone to look you nice, yeah, come in, come check me. I never want to be no one prisoner. No prisoner, I mean I want no one They come, come and roll me, and roll me Them used to laugh when me go to school Them say me want to come for You can't take me for no boo-boo And then you treat me like doo-doo And now I'm gonna make you You come control me Now you give me a little something And now I'm gonna make you you come control me because you give me a little pump pump. Yes, we use the good time. It never lasts no long time. <laughs> see there, you see it there. <laughs> so please, ladies and gentlemen, don't say me never, me never, me never give a little something. Yes. <laughs> No, say me never give a little something. You hear me? All right. So we gone, we gone, we gone, we gone, we gone. All right. For real now. <laughs> Yo, some of the parents for know why you them are going with you now. Don't just allow you them for roam the street. Take responsibility for you them. You know what I'm doing tonight? You know what I'm going tonight? The Diddy's Francis. Um, remember what? Three more questions. Come on, people. Three more questions. And who will leave red flag there? Rudy, yeah. just ignore it, Rudy. <laughs> <laughs> ignore <laughs> it. <laughs> 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 oh, you just step out. <laughs> Rudy is frozen. <laughs> Listen, man, I was born here, yeah? East End up, born and bred, and you. Oh, good, them Let's kids. Let's have our own conversation. <laughs> Forget about them, lot. <laughs> I must say, first of all, um, those who are on YouTube, make sure you subscribe to YouTube, our Anything Goes YouTube podcast. And then when we go live, you get the notification. Young people, plenty of money. Down in the mill ground. You remember the mill ground? That's, uh, yeah, and the reason being is that, number one, that the way how things are taught is well beneath the standard of your child. So your child's now having to bum itself oh, down. Red flags and we don't know who they're for. Heaven, heaven, is, heaven is between a woman's legs as far as I'm concerned. Come on, Rudy, man. No, no, right there, right no. there. Like, put, send them picnic to bed. Rudy, and I, 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 and red card, and I, and I, and I, and I, and
What a wonderful world. 